Hey everyone, and welcome to XSTEM All Access. I'm Dr. Trace Finara, and I'm excited to be part of this virtual XSTEM series showcasing some of the coolest minds in STEM. Have you ever wondered what it's like to work in a STEM field like oceanography or space exploration, or like my job, environmental engineering? Or are you curious about careers in science and technology, but you're not sure what jobs are out there? Or maybe you have no idea what type of career to pursue and you're searching for a little inspiration. Well, if you fall into any of these categories, or even if you're just here for fun, you've come to the right place because this is gonna be a blast. As your guest host for this episode, I am so excited to chat with NASA climate scientist, Josh Willis. I'm going to ask all the questions you'd like to know about his job, like what inspires him, how he found his path, and what's happening in the world of climate science. Make sure you subscribe in the YouTube description below and follow us on social media to get XSTEM updates. New episodes will be released all year long and you won't want to miss a single one. Scan this code to access resources from today's program, including NGSS aligned lesson plans and worksheets, along with other free STEM resources from today's speaker, our partners, and more. With your parents' permission, tell us how you were inspired today by tagging us at USA Science Fest, hashtag XSTEM, and me at Inspector Planet. This free STEM program is brought to you by the USA Science and Engineering Festival. The mission of the USA Science and Engineering Festival is to inspire the next generation with careers in STEM. You can check out other free programs and events for teachers and students at usasciencefestival.org. Before we begin, please join me in thanking our partners, the US Air Force, the US Space Force, and Discovery Channel for making this X STEM series possible. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Dr. Tracy Fnara. I'm an environmental engineer and hydrologist driven to solve mysteries and problems through principles of science. My career has taken me on quite a journey as a design engineer, storm chaser, field and laboratory researcher, and now an ocean scientist at our nation's environmental intelligence agency, more formally called the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or as you might know it, NOAA. My journey has allowed me to get up close and personal with birds, alligators, sharks, toxic algae, and even hurricanes. I've had the opportunity to develop water treatment technology for both Earth and space, run a camp called Mission Tampa Bay for middle school girls, and have been able to share my passion for environment with the world through television shows on National Geographic, Discovery, The Weather Channel, Fox Weather, ABC, NBC, CBS, and Newsy. I hope you are just as excited as I am to meet today's speaker. Josh Willis is a climate scientist and oceanographer working to better understand climate change. He's the principal investigator for NASA's Oceans Melting Greenland, or OMG program, where he studies how oceans temperatures affect Greenland's massive glaciers. Using sensors that are dropped into the seas around Greenland's coast, he researches the rate at which warming oceans are melting some of the largest glaciers on Earth. In addition to his job studying climate change, Josh is also a comedian who uses humor to break down the barriers around the topic of global warming to better communicate his work to a broad audience. We're gonna see a little bit of that humor today too. Please join me in welcoming Josh Willis. Josh, let's jump right into our first question because I know the audience is super excited to hear from you. Tell us what inspired you to become an oceanographer and a climate scientist. Thanks, Tracy. It's really great to be here. You know, even as a kid, I was always super curious about the world. I always wanted to take everything apart and figure out how it worked. I wasn't so great at putting things back together, which is probably why I'm a scientist instead of an engineer. But I always remember asking my mom, you know, how everything worked and, and how things were put together. Eventually, when she ran out of answers, she started buying me books or sending me to the library. Uh, the library is a big room filled with books. It's where you used to go before Wikipedia to figure something out. But anyway, I became uh, really curious about the world and it was that curiosity that ultimately made me want to be a scientist. Oceanography and climate science kind of came along later after I struggled with uh, trying to actually do a career in physics. But in the end, what I realized was I really wanted to study something about the world that mattered to people everywhere um, and to everyday life. 
and eventually I found oceanography and climate science and that's what I've been doing ever since. Wow, the desire to connect a career to solving everyday problems is something I can definitely relate to as an environmental engineer whose responsibility is to make sure your house doesn't flood and your faucet turns on water and that when you flush your toilet, the water goes where it's supposed to. So I totally get that. When most people think about NASA though, they think of astronauts, rockets, planets, and all space-related things. Being an oceanographer and a climate scientist for NASA is a bit of an unexpected combination. So tell us more about your work and research at NASA and how it fits in with the mission of our nation's space agency. Yeah, even me, when I was growing up, I used to think of NASA as studying distant planets. And you probably know about the James Webb Telescope, taking these amazing pictures of galaxies or landing stuff on Mars, sending people to the space station. But actually, NASA spends a lot of its time and its resources looking back at the Earth and trying to understand what's happening here. So satellites like the one that I work on, the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich satellite, look down and measure how high the oceans are. They tell us sea level from space with an accuracy of just about one inch from 800 miles up. It's an incredible technological feat, but it's super important for oceanographers like me who study how currents are changing and how sea level shifts around as the ocean moves heat around in the ocean, but also how humans are driving climate change. These satellites give us the clearest picture of how humans are warming up the planet and causing sea levels to rise everywhere. How cool is it that we can measure sea level from space? Josh, I'm so glad that you brought up sea level because that's one of the ways that we at NOAA collaborate with NASA. We translate satellite data for our models, which allows ships, local governments, and even people at the beach to make daily decisions. The exploration of space and the unknown is obviously super exciting, but I love the idea that we're also using NASA technology to look towards our planet and solve issues here on Earth. So Josh, did your family background, upbringing, or childhood experiences influence your career choice at all? And second, did you have any role models growing up? Yeah, my mom growing up was really my inspiration and, and role model in a lot of ways. She was a science teacher, and even though I never had her directly as a teacher in one of my classes, she definitely instilled in me a sense of curiosity about the world, um, and also a desire to figure out how it works and to get it right. Um, you know, she helped me realize that uh, you know the stuff we study on the planet usually there's a right answer, and if you work really hard and you try and figure out what that is. Sometimes you can learn something about the Earth or the universe that nobody even knew before. So I think she helped me um, find that kind of inner curiosity that's so important for being a good scientist and, uh, you know, just important for life too, I think. Curiosity and wonder are critical components of scientific discovery. If you have curiosity for the world around you, why not use it to make an impact? Josh, can you explain any roadblocks or obstacles you've encountered along your career path? How did you overcome these and how did they influence who you are today? Yeah, of course I've had some roadblocks in my time. The biggest one was probably when I actually failed out of the physics program trying to get a PhD. I knew after I finished college that I wanted to be a scientist and I studied physics in college, so I thought, well, I'll try to get a PhD in physics. But the problem was I never really found anything in physics that I wanted to study that ignited my passion and my curiosity like it had when I was younger. And eventually um, I failed out and it was a really tough period. I, I knew I wanted to be a scientist. I thought I wanted to be a physicist. But I was really lucky because I found another PhD program studying oceanography and studying climate change and how that affected people and, and how it all blended together. And when I found that, I realized that all along I had wanted to study something I felt was important, something that was, uh, uh, you know, really had an impact on people's everyday lives. 
and it turned out that climate change was it. And so I started a new career and eventually uh, found my way to NASA where I look at sea level rise and then sometimes I even fly around in airplanes around Greenland trying to understand how the oceans are melting away the ice from below. So in the end, I think uh, I probably was lucky to have failed out of physics because I found something that I really loved and am passionate about. Wow, Josh, this is such, such an important message. We don't always end up on the path that we embark on, and it's never too late to change course, especially when it leads you to a career that you're super passionate about. Allowing your career to be a journey and following your passion is key to loving your work. I took a few huge turns in my career. I went from geology to microbiology, then modeling for civil engineering design, and did it for years before I found where I felt I needed to be to make an impact. I took the risk of going back to school for a master's in engineering and PhD focused on stormwater and water treatment. Then I worked with toxic algae, which then presented the opportunity to work with NASA to put aquaponics in space and monitor algae from space. Now at NOAA, I'm using all of these skills I've gathered along my way to solve some of our most challenging problems, just like you are. Josh, so what other types of STEM professionals do you interact with or work alongside of as part of your daily job? Well, I actually work with a lot of other scientists who study similar things as me, like oceanographers and glaciologists. But there's a ton also of engineers at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory where I work, and they actually build the satellites and the instruments that we use to do this science. And also, when I'm really lucky, I get to work with someone like an artist, like the artist who helped me make this logo for my mission Oceans Melting Greenland, or OMG for short, or this animation that actually shows how the oceans are eating away at Greenland's glaciers from below. So I think it's not just important for me to figure out how the world works, I think scientists have a responsibility to help explain what we learn to everyone. And that's especially true when you're studying something like climate change. I couldn't agree more. As scientists, we have a responsibility to communicate our findings. So it's understandable and relatable for everyone. And let's talk about that animation video you mentioned. Everyone, I encourage you to use this QR code, head over to the resource page to view this entire animation depicting how a glacier melts. It's an amazing resource, but especially if you have an interest in our changing climate, you have to see this. Now back to our questions. Josh, what does a typical workday look like for you? Well, like most scientists these days, I spend a fair amount of time in front of a computer. But every once in a while, I get to jump in an airplane and go to some place like Greenland and fly around and try and measure how the oceans are eating away at Greenland's ice from the edges. Every once in a while, we get to fly around something really amazing, like this giant iceberg that we flew past. This one was actually so tall, it blotted out the sun when it went by. If you think science is boring, come, come talk to Josh, or me, or, or anyone on USA Science and Engineering Fest, because Science is so exciting, so exciting because we still have so many questions that need to be answered. So anyway, back, back to our regular scheduled programming. What is the farthest place you've ever traveled for work or for fun? Well, even though I've been places that are a larger distance away from my house, I'd have to say Greenland felt the farthest away from home. About 10 years ago, I started writing a proposal to NASA to try and understand how the oceans were eating away at Greenland's ice from below. And at the time, I'd never even been to Greenland. When I finally got there, I saw this landscape that was just incredibly dramatic. Huge glaciers that carved out channels into the mountains, dumping enormous amounts of ice into the oceans, and gigantic icebergs that we flew past Sometimes they were so tall, they even blocked out the sun when we went by. It was really an incredibly dramatic landscape, and one that gave me a pre an appreciation for just how huge our human footprint is on the planet's climate. 
because this ice sheet, which is so big that if you get in a jet and fly for two hours over the top of it, all you see is the ice for miles and miles around. This gigantic ice sheet is being melted by human caused climate change. So it really gave me an appreciation of just how big an influence we're having on our planet's climate and how important it is that we try and figure out just how fast this ice is gonna melt. A trip like that is definitely on my bucket list. Speaking of your travels to Greenland, let's take a look at this brief video to learn more about the OMG mission and see some of that breathtaking landscape you mentioned. There's enough ice here in Greenland to raise sea levels by 25 feet all the way around the world. It's an incredible amount of ice and it's melting and adding to sea level rise. For oceans melting Greenland, what we really want to do is measure the oceans, measure the ice, and watch them change together year on year and try and answer the question, how much are the oceans melting away the ice, as opposed to the air, which is what most people have studied so far. It's really a breathtaking landscape. These giant mountains and uh, canyons are all along the coast. When you look out the window, you really get a sense of just how huge these glaciers are, these gigantic rivers of ice that are draining the ice out of Greenland into the ocean. And then they reach the ocean and it gets all broken and craggy and big chunks fall off. It's incredibly dramatic. Kulasuk is just a tiny little town in southeast Greenland and we've been launching probes out of here for the past four or five days. It's already been a fantastic year for OMG measuring the oceans. We launch them right out of this tube right over here. Open up the tube, you can look right down it and see the water uh, passing by or sometimes the icebergs or clouds or whatever it is we're flying over. Six, we slow down a little bit and we just push these big gray cylinders out of the bottom of the plane and they fall to the ocean and measure the temperature and salinity when they get there and radio it back to the plane. We're really trying to look at the ice and ocean all the way around Greenland. So we're dropping 250 profilers. We're going to cover uh, the coastline all the way around. And in the spring, we map out the glaciers with a, a radar also all the way around. So we're really looking at mapping all of the ocean ice interactions in Greenland as best we can with one mission. What we care about with OMG really is the breaking off at the edges. As the water eats away at the ice, then it can actually speed up that breaking off part. And when you dump more ice in the oceans, then it causes sea level rise. So OMG is really here to try and figure out how much are the oceans doing? How much is this kind of breaking off of the ice? It's called calving. How important is that relative to the melting at the surface? And more importantly, is the ocean causing some of this speed up of the calving? We think it is, but how widespread is it and how big an impact? Even the smallest iceberg looks gigantic when you're right next to it. We saw an iceberg that was grounded in the bay. Remember, 90% of the iceberg is below sea level. So if there's about 10 meters or about 30 feet of ice above sea level, then 300 feet are below. It's a reminder that a lot of the stuff we're trying to measure is hidden below the surface of the ocean hidden below the surface of the ice, and peering down into both of those is really at the core of what OMG is trying to do. Dramatic and breathtaking for sure. Seriously, if you ever need an environmental engineer on hand for an upcoming expedition, I would be more than happy to help with probes, to help with your bags, whatever it takes. I would love to go with you. To keep us on schedule, we only saw a portion of that amazing video. To see the rest, use this QR code and head over to the resources page for the direct link. I highly recommend it. It's absolutely amazing. So Josh, what advice would you give kids who are concerned about climate change and want to make an impact, but aren't sure what career path to follow? Well, of course, if you want to have a job in science or engineering or technology, you're going to have to work pretty hard in school and keep studying in those math and science classes. 
they're going to be important for you later on. But I think what's even more important than that is to learn to think critically about the world around you. Dive deep into the topics that you're interested in. Don't always assume that the first easy answer explains everything, because usually it doesn't. So work hard, keep studying, and stay curious about the world around you. Those are the most important things. Definitely stay curious. And those math and science classes do become important later on. As if working to solve global warming wasn't hard enough, I heard you do a great Elvis impression. Is that true? Elvis impersonation? I don't know what you're, uh... How are y'all doing? Well, whenever somebody calls my name, I have to appear. Hope y'all are having a good time, and I hope you're ready to learn a little something about the climate from this little song that I wrote called The Climate Rock. Take it away. Hello there, little lady. Say, what's climate? Well, you curious little ankle biter, climate is the generally prevailing weather conditions, including temperature, precipitation, humidity, wind, cloudiness, as a function of time throughout the year, composited over many years. What? Let me try something a little different. Sunday on Sunday, high 73. Monday, rain was pouring down on me. Tuesday was cold, I almost froze my toes. But what's it gonna be next week? Who knows? That's weather. Oh, that's the weather you got. Oh. But you take a bunch of weather and you average it together and you do in the climate rock. A climate is the average of the weather you see. The critters and plants all know where to be. A cactus can't live in the tropical rain. And all the bears don't dig by rain. That's climate. Wait a minute. So, are you saying that plants and animals know about climate too? Well, that's right, little Miss Jane Goodall. Every living thing on Earth is adapted to the very specific climate that it lives in. Wow, that's wild. That's not just wild. Well, that's, that's climate. Oh, that's the climate you got, maybe. You take a bunch of weather and you average it together and you do in the climate rock. The sun beams down right through the sky. It warms the earth like an apple pie. The top gets a little and the middle gets a lot. So the bones are cold, the equator is hot. That's climate. Wait a minute. You're saying that the earth is warmed up by the sun? That's right, little Miss Sally Ride. The sun gives the earth pretty much all the heat it needs. And the places that get more sun, well, they're warmer. Wow, that's cool. That's not just cool. That's climate. Oh, that's the climate you got. You take a bunch of weather and you have it together and you do in the climate rock. Well, the climate has been changing because of greenhouse gases we spew. They trap the heat and warm the earth and melt the glaciers too. The globe, it has been warming, but the weather still blows through. So just because it's cold sometimes doesn't mean it isn't true. Global warming, oh, that's global warming. You bet that's climate too when there's global warming. That's climate, oh, that's the climate you got. Uh -huh. You take a bunch of weather and you average it together and you're doing the climate rock. You take a bunch of weather and you average it together and you do in the climate rock. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Josh, that is amazing. Climate Rock is officially my new favorite song. For our last question, Climate Elvis. Can you <laughs> give students one takeaway or thought to leave with today? Well, kids, that's about it for me. Remember, stay curious. Every day is a new day to learn something new about the world. Tracy, you stay cool. I will stay cool and curious. Well, I couldn't think of a better way to end our talk today than with those inspiring words. Thank you so much, Josh and Climate Elvis. I love chatting with you and hearing about your work to fight climate change. 
keep fighting. Your job as a NASA climate scientist is truly impacting all of us. Everyone, make sure you go follow OMG NASA on social media to keep up with Josh and the OMG project. But don't go anywhere yet. Let's take a moment to hear more from our partners at the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Space Force. Make sure you check out the Air Force and Space Force online and follow them on social media to keep up with all the amazing things that they're doing. Thank you again to the United States Air Force, the United States Space Force, and the Discovery Channel for making this XSTEM All Access series possible. Stay tuned for more episodes this fall, including special guest speakers from the Discovery Channel's Shark Week. And thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube subscription below and follow us on social media to get XTEM updates about new episodes. You won't want to miss any of them. Plus, you'll get access to fun weekly content for students and teachers, such as STEM trivia for students, classroom tips for teachers, and so much more. Scan this code to access resources from today's program, including NGSS aligned lesson plans and worksheets, along with other free STEM resources from today's speakers, our partners, and more, including the climate rock music videos and other video resources from Josh Willis and the OMG program. With your parents' permission, tell us how you were inspired today by tagging us at USA Science Fest, hashtag XSTEM, and me at Inspector Planet. Keep up with my website and social media at Inspector Planet. I hope you have enjoyed today's program. This episode, along with the entire series, is available on demand at no cost. Check them out at usasciencefestival.org. I had a blast as your host today, but don't sign off just yet. You'll want to stick around through the end of this video for a fun trivia game that you can do in the classroom or at home. Have a blast.